and they screwed him. The Transformers franchise is a definitive embodiment of the sad reality that success at the global box office isn't achieved by intriguing, competent filmmaking, but instead by the three Bs. Butts and boobs and stuff going boom. There's really not much to say about these movies because for the most part they're all the same. Badly written visual noise. But if there is one film in this five film series that does serve as an interesting case study worth talking about, it's the first 2009 sequel, Revenge of the Fallen. This because unlike all the other entries, Revenge of the Fallen isn't actually badly written. Because it was never written. See, around 2008 there was a writer's strike in Hollywood which prevented writers from working on movies or TV shows, including those just entering production like Revenge of the Fallen. And from what I understand, here's what happened. Prior to the upcoming strike, the writers of this movie raced against time to create this very general document of major events and plot points that the story would consist of, which they then handed off to director Michael Bay just as the strike began. And then the only thing Michael Bay could do is take this very general plot point document and enter production with it. As in, he set out to make a 200 million blockbuster without a writer or a script. And the interesting question then is, what's the result? of that. Well, first off, there's a couple obvious things. One result was mind-numbingly endless excess of action. If you wonder why there are so many consecutive action sequences in Quantum of Solace, for example, this is why. Because they didn't have a script either and didn't really know what else to do. Hey Daniel, yeah. listen, we still have some runtime to fill, so do you want to jump that motorcycle into that boat? Yeah, okay. <laughs> The other result was the lack of any written dialogue, which gave birth to very iconic Michael Bay lines and moments like these. Mojo, no dominating Frankie. Yo, Papa, bad news, bro. Ran out of toilet paper. You got any out here? Name's Willie. Yeah. Say my name, say my name. But the thing is, Michael Bay movies feature an excess of action as well as iconic Michael Bay lines and moments anyway, so this didn't really differ from the norm. But what did differ from the norm, at least the norm set by the first film, were the much more severe results of not having a script. The results and causes that despite this movie actually having great entertaining actors as well as highly talented people behind the camera, turned the whole thing into an unwatchable dumpster fire. So let's see what those causes and results are. In what ways not having a script made Revenge of the Fallen an unwatchable cinematic mess? Let's see what happens when you make a movie without a writer. The first main issue with Revenge of the Fallen is that despite all the loud action sequences, the experience of watching it as a whole is extremely boring. The type of boring that will put even the most devoted fan to sleep. This because due to not having a finished script, it features some of the most shameless, absolutely worst exposition dump sections I've ever seen or heard. What exposition means in a nutshell is information necessary for the audience to know in order for the events of the movie to make sense. We've touched on it before and how we can often be a clear sign of production disorder. He's like, here's the problem, Kev. We've been shooting this movie for three months. Every time we have a problem on the movie, every time we hit a plot hole, something that doesn't make sense, all we've been saying is, you know what, we'll put it in the warlock scene. Because this is our big expositional scene where we can talk about shit and reveal the villain's motives and shit like that and handle a bunch of things that we haven't handled because we've been blowing shit up. Just tell us what you know about Thomas Gabriel, all right? That's why we came here. Thomas and what Revenge of the Fallen gives us is an excellent peek into how terrible studio exposition actually comes to be. For example, look at the first major plot point of the movie. The Decepticons set out to steal the one remaining shard of the Allspark from the military so that they can go use it to reawaken Megatron who lies dead at the bottom of the ocean. But once we actually get to this plot point, there's a bit of a problem. None of this information has been established. We don't know the military has one remaining shard of the Allspark. We don't know Megatron is still in one piece at the bottom of the ocean. We don't know anything because we've been too busy just blowing shit up. Meaning that the plot event can't actually begin because it would make no sense. And that's why this happens. Now, what do we know so far? 
We know that the enemy leader, aka Megatron, is resting in peace at the bottom of the Laurentian abyss. We also know that the only remaining piece of your alien all spark is locked in an electromagnetic vault here on one of the most secure naval bases in the world. To be clear, exposition in of itself isn't evil necessarily, and instead more of a necessary evil all movies need. But there is a proper way to deliver it in smaller, organic, unnoticeable nuggets through action and events. Here, for example, a writer would have probably established this key information in the opening. Instead of the Autobots hunting, hiding, Decepticons just for the sake of some cool action, a rider would have had the Decepticons in the opening already be looking for the shard to awaken Megatron with, so that without us even realizing it, we understand that the shard and Megatron exist. But because there was no writer to do this, all we got was multiple minutes of this guy just explaining all of it as one big boring dump. And you might argue that Filmento, it's just one few minute section, not a big deal. And you'd be right if it was just one few minute section. But in cases like this, it never stops at just one. Throughout this entire movie, we get more and more scenes where characters just explain vital information through verbal exposition, which not only makes the whole thing come off as insignificant and boring, but sometimes also just downright confusing when the person giving the information is some minor side character we don't even know. Leo. The Prime can defeat me. My grandfather went on this Arctic mission, right? And he saw a Megatron, Megatron zapped him, and started seeing these crazy symbols. The FBI is still trying to locate the boy, Sam. These symbols can lead us to the Energon source. It harvests Energon by destroying suns. All options are being considered. Whatever the Decepticons are after, this is just the start. <laughs> And this problem only gets worse with time, because the further we go, the bigger the pile of undelivered necessary information grows, and so at some point it will have to be dumped on us. Which at the midpoint is exactly what happens, resulting in possibly the worst, most sleep-inducing, mind-numbingly boring exposition section ever put on screen. I kid you not, it's like 20 straight minutes of nothing but verbal information. First, we get exposition on how to get help with getting exposition. This guy Robo Warrior, everything about any anything alien he's supposed to know. I saw some of your uh, alien drawings or whatever. Then we get exposition on what it is we need to get exposition on. Shot in 1932. These are symbols you're seeing in your head? Same ones over here, right? Then we get exposition on how we can get that exposition. Oh, I know that. That's the language of the primes. Oh, they'll translate those symbols for you. And I know where to find them. And then we get the exposition. Our ancestors built a great machine. They were on an exploratory mission to harvest energy. In the beginning, there were seven primes. Eight, Eight primes. primes. Back Back to the and the funny thing is, I can picture a bunch of studio executives looking at this and excitedly <laughs> high-fiving each other because, yes, now our movie makes enough sense to function. But what they don't realize is that the cost of the way they made their movie make sense is that nobody wants to watch it anymore. Did you do it? Yes. What did it cost? The second main issue with this movie is that even though it does function through great cost, everything it does just comes off as shallow and overall emotionally void. Which is because even though Michael Bay had his document of major plot points, he didn't seem to know what to do with them or how to actually use them to their full design potential. For example, the main heart of this movie is Sam's relationship with Michaela and the struggles that relationship is going through. Sam's core flaw as a character is that he doesn't know how to express and trust his true feelings. Feelings. Like he clearly cares about Michaela as well as other characters, but he just isn't capable of conveying that or letting those feelings guide him. And I'll do anything for you. And? I adore you. That's not the word that I want to hear right now. What are you talking about? I want to help you. I do. But I am not some alien ambassador. You know, I'm a normal kid with normal problems. I am where I'm supposed to be. And honestly, the setup works great. It does hold a bunch of inherent power. And the way a writer would have most likely mined this power is by having Sam grow past this flaw over the course of the movie and ultimately achieve victory through the change generated by that growth. As in, at the end, he overcomes the obstacles and wins because he learns to express himself and trust his feelings. But since there is no writer here, that's not what happens. In fact, nothing really happens. Please come back. Let 
that's right, Sam appears to be dead until Michaela then says that she loves him, which then causes him to have an exposition vision and wake up to finally say that he loves her too. As in, Sam's change doesn't really change anything. It's not like he avoids death because he learns to trust and express his feelings. It's not like he overcomes an obstacle through his growth. He only grows after the obstacle has been overcome. The change isn't the cause of the result, but instead the result of the result. And you could even argue that there is no change to begin with because it's Michaela who expresses her feelings first, which kind of takes away all the power from Sam doing so after. To be fair, the setup of Sam believing in the Matrix after it has turned to dust is great, but what's missing is that one ultimate true choice and act of change he makes to earn his resurrection instead of first being resurrected for free and only then expressing the change. But the main point is that the ultimate conclusion to the heart of this movie with so much inherent power to mind just comes off feeling like nothing. And pretty much with every major plot point, it's the same thing. They're never utilized in a way to mine their designed emotional potential, but instead just swiftly flown through without any resulting effects or consequences. We have a plot beat where Sam misses his very important first Skype call with Michaela, which is designed to put more strain on their long distance relationship. But then that never leads to any real problems and instead is just kind of shrugged off as nothing. I can't believe you're gonna stand me up on our first web chat date. Something just happened to me, okay? What, you finally hit puberty? We have a plot point where Michaela finds Sam cheating on her with a hot girl, which is intended to break their relationship. But then immediately after, Michaela realizes that the hot girl is actually a Decepticon, which fixes their relationship right back up and kind of defeats the purpose of the whole thing. Look, it's not my fault, okay? I'm a victim. Listen, listen, I'm a victim. You're such a little girl. We have Sam becoming a fugitive hunted by the entire world. We're dead, bro. FBI, CIA, we are wanted fugitives now. But then nobody ever actually shows up to hunt him. The only consequential action he has to do because of this plot point is wear a hat. He does get chased by some Egyptian cops later on, but that's something that doesn't make any sense because there's no way for the cops to know it's him. Maybe there should have been more exposition about this. But the best showcase of what I mean here is the ending battle. We have this massive final plot point where the Fallen activates this giant machine meant to eat the sun, and so now we have to find a way to stop it before time runs out. But then immediately after the Fallen turns the machine on, all that happens is this. There you go, Optimus just flies in and destroys the machine on his very first try, giving this massive final plot point around one minute of runtime. I'm pretty sure what the writers meant with it was for heroes to first struggle to defeat the fallen before the machine eats the sun and then destroy it, as in make the plot point into an actual urgent obstacle we need to overcome. But I guess this Michael Bay superficial abridged version does the trick too. There's just not much power in it. The third core issue here is the fact that Revenge of the Fallen as a movie overall feels pretty dumb, because the way we move from one plot point to another is so incredibly jarring and unnatural. Since even though the plot points are written out, it's not written how they end or begin or connect or what happens in the blank spaces in between. Like the first thing you'll notice when watching this movie is the extremely sudden changes in scenery. One shot we're emerging out of the military guarded Atlantic Ocean, next shot we're flying in some distant galaxy. One more moment we're at a city warehouse, next moment we're in some dense forest without any visual reference as to how we got there. One moment we're in New York with no location text telling us that we're in New York, next moment we're in space and then in France and then back in New York now with location text telling us that we're in New York. It's so randomly nonsensical that the whole thing feels like one big mindless lucid dream and it even gets to the point where this movie has to suddenly invent teleportation just to get to the next plot beat. I told you I was opening a space. Bridge is the fastest way to travel what? to Egypt. Why are we in Egypt? Shut up. But in addition to just the visual side, this problem gets much bigger when it comes to the sudden nonsensical shifts in emotions and intentions and information from one beat to another. Look at the first scene, for example. After Optimus has died, we have these closing slow mo shots of the Autobots coming in to rescue Sam from the Decepticons. And then suddenly. That went well. We've lost the boy, Master. 
They are robots must be shielding their signals. Yeah, now we're in downtown New York with the Decepticons cursing that they lost Sam. But they never did. Just before this, they were still in the forest with Sam. So how is it they have suddenly lost him when we've never seen them lose him or even try to look for him? One second we're in this plot point, next second in the next plot point, without a connecting bridge written in between where we would gain the transitional information of the Decepticons losing Sam and failing to find him. And that's why this shift just feels kinda dumb. And the same thing repeats over over and over again. We enter and exit plot points without them ever being properly introduced or ended. We have a beat where our heroes need to find the hidden Matrix tomb, which Michael Bay makes happen by having these twin robots start fighting. Symbols. Which is just forced and stupid because the twins are given no real reason to fight here. We have a beat where Simmons needs to find a way to destroy the big Decepticon, which Michael Bay makes happen by having Simmons radio a nearby fighter ship and request them to use their classified railgun. Don't talk to me about classified, alright? Ready? That which again is downright idiotic because not only does the railgun come out of nowhere, it also then goes right back into nowhere and is never used again. And perhaps the most insulting example of them all, the third act plot beat of Sam and Michaela running through a battlefield on foot to get to Optimus, which we get into like this. We gotta split up. Bumpy, you're the decoy. You lead the Decepticons away, alright? I'm gonna get Optimus. I'll help draw their fire with you and Dewey there. You get to those soldiers. That's right, our transitional bridge into this plot beat, the reason for why Sam and Michaela go on foot instead of driving is because they need Bumblebee to drive off alone to distract Starscream who's following them. You know, despite Starscream then never actually following any of them, despite them having three cars right there to be used and only one needed for distraction, despite Bumblebee later showing up to Sam's location anyway indicating that they should've and should just drive to get to Optimus, despite all that and more, this is how this plot beat is made a reality. <laughs> Get them somewhere safe. Right? You're my son! I know! You're my son! Dad, We're listen. all going together! Listen! We're all going together! Dad, I can't go in the car yet because there's still some more Michael Bay explosions I have to be in. Run! Run! Let him go. Joking aside though, I'm not saying all this just to be yet another online voice against Michael Bay. He's not a writer, I don't blame him like I don't blame anyone on Quantum of Solace. I'm saying all this just as a reminder that whatever studio or director you might be, maybe you shouldn't make a movie without a script or at least without a writer. Because most likely, this is what happens.